Praise the Lord. Um, first thing I want to say, welcome back, Hebron family. Um, I think this is our first Sunday being back. Like, it's pretty crazy. A uh, little, little over a year ago, like this was all empty, and all we had was pastor, elders, and the volunteers. And now it's just crazy to think that everybody is here. You know, so all I can say is God is good. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so before I start, I would like to pray real quick. Um, so let's just close our eyes and bow down our heads. <clears throat> Father, we just come to your presence, Lord. Um, God, I pray that you uh, open, our, uh, open our eyes, God, Lord, that we're able to see you for who you are, God. Um, that you open up our ears, Lord, that we're hearing your voice and your voice only, Lord Jesus. God, that you're opening up our hearts to receiving your word. Um, Lord, I pray that... Um, that you convict us through your word, Lord Jesus, God. Um, that let it, let it fall on good soil, Lord Jesus, God. That your name is glorified at the end of the day, Lord Jesus. God, I pray for myself, Lord. I pray that you just take away any pride that I have, um, any selfish desires, any fleshly desires that I have, Father. God, I just lay everything at your feet. Any fear that I have, Father, I pray that you just take it all away, God. That you fill me with your peace and your love and your confidence and your boldness to share what you want me to share, Lord Jesus, God, that I'm being obedient to that, Lord Jesus, um, that your name alone is glorified in all of this, Lord Jesus. We give you everything, Lord, in Jesus' name, pray, amen. <clears throat> so the title of my message is Pay Much Closer Attention. Um, so the passage we're going to be looking at is going to be 1 Kings chapter 11, and this is a chapter where uh, Solomon turns from the Lord. Um, but to understand how we came to this point, um, we need to first look at the events prior to uh, chapter 11 and see what led to Solomon's heart to turn away from God. And we're going to be looking at these events uh, pretty fast. So if you guys want to actually dig deeper, uh, I encourage you guys to uh, read 1 Kings. But please follow along with me with um, using your Bible. And we'll have some, some of the verses up on screen. So Rennie Judge, please help me. Um, so Solomon was first introduced in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24 and 25. <clears throat> so in that passage, we see Solomon was born to David um, and, and Bathsheba, and David named him Solomon. And we also see that the Lord loved him and sent a message by uh, Nathan the prophet. Shout out, Nathan, if you're here. Uh, Nathan the prophet and called his name Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. And then if we fast forward and we come to 1 Kings chapter 11, David was old and advanced in years. And he tells, um, sorry, yeah, he tells Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet to anoint David as Solomon as the next king. And when he came, uh, and then when we come to chapter 2, we, um, before David dies, he, uh, gives, tells Solomon, uh, he gives Solomon specific instructions. And we're going to read this passage because it keeps echoing, um, um, it keeps echoing in uh, Solomon's, throughout the life of Solomon, right? And so the passage we're going to be looking at is 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> and when David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go to the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God. So it's not just David's God, but it's God, uh, Solomon's God too. Walking in his ways, keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies. That is, it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do. And wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness, with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. So you, don't, you do not see David telling Solomon to do what he has done to be successful uh, as a king, but rather tells him to pay close attention, obey and walk in God's commandments, right? And then when we get to chapter 3, this is a chapter where Solomon prays for wisdom. And in verse 3 of that ch chapter 3, it says, Solomon loved the Lord. God appears, and also in, in that chapter, we see that God appears to Solomon in a dream and asks for what he wants. And Solomon, out of all the things he could ask for, he asked for wisdom. And he, when he asked for wisdom, it actually pleased the Lord. But in verse 14 of that chapter, God reminds him to walk 
in his ways to keep his commandments and to keep his statutes, right? And when we get to chapter 5 of 1 Kings, we, we learn that God has given rest um, to Solomon from every side, that there is neither adversary or, nor misfortune. Uh, but we also see in that chapter that Solomon wants to fulfill what God has promised him, um, and which is to build the house of God. And it takes him seven years to build the house of God. And while he's building the house, God again is reminding him in chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, to obey his rules, to keep all his commands, and to walk in them. And when we get to chapter 8, we read Solomon's prayer of dedication. In verse 23, he declares that there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath. Um, or been keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. And then in verse 25 of that chapter 8, Solomon himself is repeating uh, what God promised David, right? And it says that you shall not lack a man to sit before me on the throne of Israel if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. So we also see in uh, in end of chapter 8 that Solomon is the one doing the peace offerings to the Lord. And then in chapter 9 we uh we uh in chapter 9 after Solomon had finished is the uh, as had finished the house of the Lord, um the king's house and all the things that he desired to build, God appears to him again in a dream and tells him that he has heard his plea and he has consecrated the house by putting his name there forever. But in verse 4, in that same chapter 9, God is reminding him again to walk in his ways, to obey his commandments, and keeping his statutes. In chapter 10, we learn about Solomon's great wealth, and this is where it starts becoming downhill for Solomon. Because of his wisdom, the whole earth is coming to him, coming to him and wanting to hear his wisdom. Um, they would bring him presents like garments, silver, uh, spices, myrrh, and lots of gold. He had so much gold. Like, you, you know you have lots of gold when your drinking vessels is made of pure gold. And silver was not considered anything in the days of Solomon. Another thing he had was a lot of chariots and horsemen. And, uh, and his imports of horses was from Egypt. One chariot could be imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver um, and a horse for 150 shekels of silver. So you might ask, why is this a big deal, right? Like, if silver was not considered anything in the days of Solomon, then why are we making a big deal of him spending 600 shekels of silver and 150 shekels of silver? But long before Solomon was born, in the days of Moses, God gave laws concerning um, Israel's kings in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 to 17. And we're only going to be looking at verse 16 and 17. And it goes like... um, It starts, verse 16, um, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself lest his heart turns away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. So the verse 16 and 17 is, Definitely talking about Solomon, and we see that being played out in end of chapter 10 and 11, right? Now we finally get to our passage, chapter 11. And we're only going to look at verse 1 through 11 first, and then we'll go from there. Um, Verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. So that right there is a complete contrast like in chapter 3 of verse 3 he's it says that Solomon loved the Lord now you see Solomon loving his foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh Moabite Ammonite Edomite and Sidonian and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel that you shall not enter into marriage with them neither shall be with they be with you for surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives who were princesses and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. (laughs) For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God 
as was the as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after the Ashereth of the goddess of Sidonians and after Milcom the a- abomination of the Ammonites. So Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord, uh, follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Shamash, the abomination of Moab, and Molech, the abomination of Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifices to their God. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he shall not Go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord God commanded. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant my, and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear away the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. So this is the last straw for Solomon, right? That his first love changed In the previous chapters, you saw him loving the Lord, walking in his ways, keeping his commandments and his statutes. Now, in this chapter, we see him clinging to his wives in love. In verse 2, it is said again what God said in Exodus 34, 16, that if Solomon goes into marriage with them, they will turn away his heart after their gods. And this is what we see in this chapter. Solomon's heart is turned away. And because of his wives, no longer his heart is wholly true to the Lord. He went after his wife's gods. And this is the same person in chapter 8 of 1 Kings said that there's no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath. He saw God twice in a dream. God gave him wisdom. He answered all the questions concerning the name of the Lord. And he knew God's commandments. And as we know, like he even wrote the book of Proverbs. And in multiple places in that book, he's reminding us not to forget God's teaching and to let our heart keep his commandments. He did all the offerings he could he could do in that time. And yet we see in this chapter that he is going after other gods. And it's not the first time he does this, because in verse 11, you can see that God is saying that this has been your practice, that you have not kept my covenant. And so because of his disobedience, God is going to tear the kingdom from the hand of his son, right? So, so far in this story, what can we learn from this? Like, why is the story of Solomon so relevant to us? Just like God is reminding Solomon multiple times to obey his commandments, God is reminding us as well from his word to pay closer attention, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes Not only we are supposed to just receive the words, but we are supposed to treasure up his commandments with us. That we need to guard our hearts. Accepting Jesus as our personal savior, being baptized, and being filled with the spirit is all important. But it does not stop there, church. Like, or when we reach a certain age, we don't graduate from this. And and we don't have to worry about it anymore. Like, it never stops. Every day we need to sanctify ourselves with the word. Every day we need to obey and walk in his ways. So in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 uh, one to 3, the writer of Hebrews is reminding us, us of this. And it says that, therefore, we, may, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, which is punishment, how shall we escape such, if we neglect such a great salvation? And then you also see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul is telling the church of Thessalonica to walk and please God. And even though it's, it's a letter directly to that church, it is for us as well. And we're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. And it says, finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from, from us on how, do, how you ought to walk and please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. So it does not stop there. It says more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. 
And this is the will of God for us. Your sanctification that you abstain from sexual immorality. That each of one of you know how to control his body in holiness and in honor. Not in the passion of lust, just like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things. As we have told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. Number seven, for God has not called us for impurity but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So we're not disregarding Paul's words but rather God's words if we choose not to follow it, right? So let's go back to the story of Solomon real quick. And God, so where we end off is God promised to tear the kingdom from the hand of his son Rehoboam. And, but it does not end there, right? God, if you look at from verse 14 to uh, 26, like you will see that God is raising up um, adversaries against Solomon, right? And the third one was called Jeroboam. And, um, and we see that starting verse 26. And one day Jeroboam went out of his, uh, Jerusalem and Ahijah found him on the road. Ahijah wore a new garment when he was walking there and he tore his garments into 12 pieces and he tells Jeroboam to take 10 pieces because God is going to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and give him 10 tribes, right? And even when all these adversaries were going on, uh, there was no more rest in the life of Solomon. There's still hope in all this, right? And we see that hope in verse 36. And it says, Yet to his son I will give one tribe that my David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, in the city where I have chosen to put my name. So even when they were being faithless, God is still being faithful. He is keeping his covenant with David that he is going to establish the throne of one of his sons forever that the flame of David is not going to be extinguished because of their disobedience, right? But it's pretty interesting how God said the word lamp. And what is the purpose of, uh, of a lamp in the Old Testament? If we know anything about the tabernacle, we know that there's an outer court, there's holy place, and there's uh, most holy place. The frame structure of the tabernacle was itself covered by four layers of cloth and skin. So this meant um, there, there was no way, there was no way for the light to get into the tabernacle. So there, that is why there was a, a lampstand in the holy place, right? And together with the stem and six branches, they carried seven lamps. And in Exodus 25, 37, in Numbers uh, chapter 8, verse 2, the purpose of these lamps, uh, lamps was to give light uh, in the space in front of it. And even in 2 Samuel 22, David is singing a song of deliverance. And in verse 29, he calls God his lamp. And it says that, For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. So the purpose of a lamp is to give light. And then after Solomon died, many, 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 many years later, you see Jesus coming and says in John chapter 8, verse 12, that I am the light of the world. That whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so just like Solomon was called beloved of the Lord, you see God the Father himself said this about Jesus, that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But Jesus was greater than Solomon. When people were singing Hosanna uh, to him, they thought that he was going to save them from uh, Roman government. But he came for a deeper issue. And the deeper issue was sin. He knew that we were in darkness, that we were dead in our trespasses, that we were slaves to sin, that there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. In Psalms 49, verse 7 and 8, it says that truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life, for the ransom of their life is costly and that can never suffice. But there was, but if you keep reading that, Sam, there's this hope in verse 15. That it says that God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, that he will receive me. So what is the, word, what is the meaning of the word ransom? Right? If you look at the definition online, it says a sum of money or other payment demanded for a release of a prisoner. 
So there was this price that had to be paid, right? That he had to pay for our souls. That we were in this lifelong slavery of sin. God did not give money to save us, but he sent his son to die on the cross for us. And worship team, you guys can come forward. And as they're coming, um, Isaiah 53, we see uh, suffering of, we see the suffering of our Christ. We see all that he, has, he had to go through to save us from sin, right? And just for the lack of time, we're only going to be looking at verse 4 through 7. And it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have, have gone astray. We have turned and every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was op oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to a slaughter. Like a sheep that before a shearer is silent. So he opened down his mouth. So it was not the nails that held him there. It was his love for us. Not only did he say he loved us, but he showed his love by staying there, by taking all of our sins, all of our shame, all of our iniquities. But not only that, he, he also took the justly wrath of God that we deserved. So how do we respond to this, like, agape, steadfast love that he has for us? Like, what, how do we respond to that? That we love God with all our heart. We love God with all our soul. That we love God with all our mind. And how do we show that love to him? By obeying his word and by keeping his commandments and by walking in his ways. Even in the good times, we, we have to obey. And in the bad times, we have to obey. So I just want to read one more verse and um, I'll sit down. It is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. So it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So Solomon was called beloved. Jesus is called beloved. Now we are called beloved children in Christ, right? So no longer we are sinners, that we are his sons and daughters. We are beloved. So therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. May his name be glorified.